This is Famous and Gravy, a podcast about quality of life as we see it, one dead celebrity at a time. This person died 2013, age 87. She grew up in a flat above a grocery store owned by her father. Gloria Allred? Who? I must be wrong. (laughs) Never mind. Okay. She had high standards. She expected everyone to do their work. Even some of her strongest critics accorded her a grudging respect. Lady Bird Johnson? Not Lady Bird Johnson. Boy, that's a good one. We ought to think about her for the show. All right. She rubbed many feminists the wrong way. Quote, the battle for women's rights has largely been won, she declared. Too bad she doesn't see what's happening today, huh? Uh, I think a lot of people might take issue with that statement. She believed personal responsibility and hard work were the only ways to achieve national prosperity. Um, was it Nancy Reagan? Not Nancy Reagan. Very good guess. She was the first woman to become prime minister of Britain. I just, like, looked it up yesterday when all this Boris Johnson news came out. I was, like, reading articles about her. Oh, my God. (laughs) Um, this is bad. Okay. (laughs) Madeline Albright? Not Madeline no. Albright. Not Madeline Albright. Uh, she was nicknamed the Iron Lady. Oh, Margaret Thatcher? Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> Today's dead celebrity is Margaret Thatcher. Oh, my <laughs> For me, there is no choice. I do not intend to be the first woman prime minister of a mediocre and declining Britain. <laughs> And I do intend to be its first woman prime minister. Welcome to Famous and Great. I'm Michael Osborne. My name is Amit Kapoor. And on this show, we choose a celebrity who died in the last 10 years and review their quality of life. We go through a series of categories to figure out the things in life that we would actually desire and ultimately answer a big question. Would I want that life? Today, Margaret Thatcher, died 2013, age 87. Category one, grading the first line of their obituary. Margaret Thatcher, the, quote, Iron Lady of British politics, who set her country on a rightward economic course, led it to victory in the Falklands War, and helped guide the United States and the Soviet Union through the Cold War's difficult last years, died on Monday in London. She was 87. It's very factual. It's it very factual. Sounds like a very, it sounds like they liked her a lot. That was my reaction. There's a lot of praise in here, especially for the New York Times. Yes. What is just glaringly missing from this first line of the obituary is how controversial and like polarizing she is. Yes. And this is basically nothing but praise. Let's talk about one word, right word. I picked up on that as well. Ooh, because wee, that's loaded. You mean in the double meaning of right? Like right word in terms of right-leaning politics, but also right word in terms of like- Correct. correct. Yeah, drinks. As if that was the way it was supposed to be. Like yes. the, the right word economic course. But it's also, I think not acknowledging the divisiveness is a bit of an omission of fact. I couldn't agree more. I'm sort of shocked. Like it would have been very easy to say Margaret Thatcher, the- polarizing iron lady of British politics. It would have taken a single word to call out the fact that her legacy and her perception in the UK and really abroad is really split. Correct. And I think we've slanted obituaries before for being too opinionated. Yeah, I'm Perot. Yes. Yeah. But this uh, this sort of lack of acknowledging the controversy seems weird. Well, okay, so let's set aside that omission, because I think we're pretty firmly agreed that that is an omission. What about the rest of it? I mean, there's a sort of nod to domestic stuff, set our country on a rightward economic course, and I agree, like, that's loaded. And then it's all international from there. The victory in the Falklands helped guide the U.S. and the Soviet Union through the Cold War's difficult last years, which I do think all of that's very, very true. 
and is a nod to her bigger legacy. Correct. It's just it, resume it, points. So I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of that. Hypothetically, had this included the word polarizing or controversial or divisive? Controversial is good enough. You know, it's light enough. Yeah, it's also a little bit vague, though. If you're every politician is controversial in their way. I mean, very few of them are real uniters. Most of them, especially in the modern era, like trade and divisiveness. And in fact, that's what I would argue that like she's like an early example of modern politics in terms of being a non-consensus politician. Like she was about divisiveness and leaned into it. Yes. For years now in British politics, this word, you must use it, consensus, has reared its head. You must have a consensus. Uh, it's, a, it's a word, again, you used not to use when I first came in politics. We had convictions. And we tried to persuade people that our convictions were the right ones. And it's no earthly good having convictions unless you have the will to translate those convictions into action. That is really missing. Your question was if it included some nod to that. Yeah, I I mean, the, the more I look at that omission, the bigger that omission gets. Everything else about this, you know, I love that they include the nickname, yes. Iron Lady. Like, it's a great nickname. I think we said this in the Yogi Berra episode. Like, it was one of the all-time great sport nicknames. This is definitely one of the all-time great political nicknames. Amen to that. Really, this score is going to boil down to how much you dock for that omission, I think. And I'll tell you how much I dock. I probably would have given it an eight. I'm taking it down three points at an even five for without okay. it. Okay, that's pretty close to where I was at. I was going to go six. Because there's a lot I do like about it. I mean, there is a, like, grand world stage presented in this obituary, and she's on it. And she's at the center of it. And it's pretty fascinating. And so I like that the overall presentation of a, you know, important figure, whatever you make of her, like, you have to take her seriously. So I, I do think that there is something about the way this is presented and written that captures her stature. But I also... The omission is worth four points, at least. And I don't know if this would have been a 10 before. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going six. Okay. Yeah, going six. So you're a five, I'm a six. Kind of middling. All right. Category two, five things I love about you. Here, Amit and I work together to come up with five reasons why we ought to be talking about this person, why we might love them. Whew. Can we just, let's, let's give number one, just first woman to lead a Western democracy. Yeah, I think that is no question the first number one. I had effective decision maker and leader, and then I wanted to talk about her femininity. It's not just the pioneering aspect, right? It's not just first woman prime minister of a major Western power. It is also an effective one, that she had an agenda, that she executed on that agenda, and that, you know, she was an unquestioned leader of her party, you know, for a time of her nation. So I want to talk about her femininity, I guess, here under this thing I love about her. Okay, so number one is just this blanket femininity. The headline being the first woman to lead a Western democracy. Yeah. Just bravo, applause. It doesn't matter. That's pioneering. That's groundbreaking. We still haven't even done it in the United States. Right. So bravo. 1979, people who know nothing else, it's good for the future and good for all generations. That's simple fact. Yeah, but I, I, the way you're, I'm hearing you describing it, you're pointing to pioneering accomplishments. And I'm actually wanting to have a discussion here in thing one about the nature of that leadership quality, because I don't know what the fuck to make of it, basically. Okay. All I, right, bring I, it. I, well, I've really, really thought about this. There's a great article I came across in L magazine where all these people debate, like, should we consider Margaret Thatcher a feminist icon? And the consensus is a pretty resounding no, because she doesn't do anything in her political life to further the cause of equal gender rights. Absolutely not. Right. However, her existence as, you know, the leader of a country, girls, women, boys, everybody grew up with, like, this is possible and this is normal. And so that has to be taken seriously in terms of its significance. Then I think that there's a whole separate discussion of, her femininity as leadership qualities. And on that score, I don't know what to make of it. I read this biography where the author really did a good job of sort of saying, most of the time it's hard for a woman to be in a position of power. And Margaret Thatcher turned a series of characteristics that were clearly feminine characteristics to her advantage as a leader. Give me an example of those characteristics. 
this is the argument that this particular author makes. She kind of comes up with these archetypes. Great diva, mother of the nation, coy flirt, the housewife, the matron, the warrior queen. And then, and she then makes the case that Margaret Thatcher turned all of these characteristics to her advantage at different points throughout her political career, which I think is a thing to love, whether you identify as a man or a woman. But I also don't know what the hell to make of her as a feminist figure, because she's so clearly uninterested in, you know, quote unquote, feminist causes. What she actually stood for was anti-feminist or rather non-feminist. Yeah, I think non-feminist is as generous as you could make it. I mean, she's certainly not a champion of like equal pay, for example, or of reproductive rights or anything that you would sort of consider a feminist cause, I suppose. So there's some perplexing there, but how do we sum this into a point? I don't know. I think this is the kind of thing that's going to actually be debated for a long time in terms of traditional woman roles as it was understood in 1980 and why her then. What I think is the thing to sum up and love is that she figured out what worked for her and it took her all the way to the top and not only allowed her to win the prime minister seat, but also execute her agenda, ultimately. So I think maybe our point, if it were a text message, is feminist icon, exclamation point, dot, 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 question mark. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. All right, what do you got for number two? I'm going to just take it down a notch. Let's make it a little more lighthearted than that. First one, voice lessons at the advice of Laurence Olivier. Did you know about this? I didn't know about the Laurence Olivier piece. I knew about the voice lessons. Well, Laurence Olivier just sort of jumped in, was a a tiny part of it. So as she was rising in politics, television critic Clive James compared her voice in 1973 to a cat sliding down a blackboard. So Thatcher's publicist set to work on this, and he met, by chance, Laurence Olivier, who arranged voice lessons for the rising Margaret Thatcher with the National Theater's voice coach. That's incredible. So I liked that little intersection, but I also like she had to be groomed Yeah, a little bit. There was a attention to the image. Yeah. It was moderately manicured, yeah. you know, to get there. Why is that a thing you love? Isn't that sort of a natural part of politics, period? I mean, didn't, didn't everybody have to craft their image? What I really love, Michael, and this is the vanity, is just the intersection with Laurence Olivier. <laughs> Because I always like those stories, right? Because it is an intersection of politics and entertainment, and it's part of a life story. Do you think Vidal Sassoon had anything to say about her hairspray? Uh, I think he hated her hair. He he had to have hated her. Yeah, no, he's all about angles, and this is nothing but curves. It's a rightward wave. It it (laughs) it is a rightward wave. Uh, Well said. I'm going to keep this light for my number three. Okay. She could hold it. Like, hold her urine. Really, really well. What? Yeah. So there's a great story in this biography I read where she travels to Russia to meet Gorbachev. And there is a 13-hour meeting. And this story is told to the biographer through a deputy. And the deputy, by hour nine, is losing it and is like, where's the bathroom? And he can't find the exit to the the door to the bathroom. And Gorbachev is kind of laughing and then says, ha it's over there. Apparently, the whole 13 hours... Margaret Thatcher never left to go to the bathroom. Was there a secret behind this, like how she did it? I think it had to do with like grit, focus, hard work ethic. You know, I I am not here to urinate. I am here to talk to Gorbachev. (laughs) And nothing is going to interrupt the flow of that, no matter what else. I mean, really, what we could say is focus in a sense. But But yeah, it does say something to her resoluteness. There is a mind over matter aspect in that. Indeed. I take it she's not a beer drinker, at least during these 13-hour meetings. I don't think so, although apparently she did enjoy a good drink. I could see that. This is good. Next time I leave the house, I'm going to tell my dog, like, I'll be back in 13 hours. If Margaret Thatcher could do it, you could too. (laughs) I'm sure Rookie will understand that. Yes. A good one. Good fact finding. Thank you. You want to take number four? Yes. I'm going to go last name legacy. Thatcherism and Thatcherite both became vocabulary words. Reading through all of these articles and all the obituaries, there's all these references to Thatcherism or this is a Thatcherite policy that she had that impact. I'll say one other thing about the name. I really like the name Thatcher. Like you can feel like a knife in there somewhere. You know, it's got an onomatopoeia. Because yeah, it's got a butcher. That sounds aggressive. (laughs) Correct. (laughs) It's a little threatening, you know. Um, So do you understand that as... Uh, political tactics or policy or both? I think 
Thatcherism is the politics and Thatcherite is the tactic. Yeah. So I understand it as both having that sort of indelible impact. Good one. I had that in, as well, actually. I mean, would you like a Kapoorism or? A Kapoorism is very different. Yeah, okay. What is Kapoorism as you understand it? In my context, mm. um, it would be sort of uh, feigned irreverence. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to think about what Osbornism is. I mean, I, that is actually sort of the point, though, right? Is that I'm not sure I could define Osbornism. Nor are you able to. It is for other people to define. That, but I also do think that the prerequisite is extreme conviction, right? That you cannot have an ism attached to your last name unless you know exactly what you're all about. Correct. And probably can't have it unless you, this is point number one, not only have an agenda, but execute it. Correct. Right. So where are we at? Have we done four? We've done four. Okay. So you've got number five then. Whew. This is almost a Malkovich kind of moment. But when she first took office, she quoted the St. Francis prayer. Yes, I saw that. I'm not a big prayer guy. You know, prayer makes me uncomfortable for the most part. But I really like the St. Francis prayer. Okay. Give it to us. All right, let me see if I can do it. Lord, make me a channel of your peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. Where, where there, there is, is discord, dis may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we may bring, bring hope. hope. That's good. That's the first half. Yeah, and I think that's where that's and perhaps I like where she all ended of those it. things. I like that. Where's this problem? Let me bring a solution. The, the language of that first half of the Saint Francis Prayer is, I think, like a good vision. I even like the opening channel of peace. Yes, that's the good thing that we should all aspire to, regardless of your religious or spiritual affiliations. Correct. Okay, so two two points. Okay. One, I believe when she gave it, when you say, for example, "May I bring truth," she did say it the right political way of saying, may we bring faith. Yes. May we bring truth. May we bring harmony. She understood herself to be representative of a population. Correct. And secondly, how do you know the prayer? Oh, it's it had been meaningful to me in different places. I learned it outside of church. It was something I came across several years ago that exactly for the reasons I just said it. I like all of those aspirations and I decided to commit it to memory. I love it. Yeah. I'm going to put that on one of the top five things I love about Michael Osborne. Oh. At this moment. Thanks, man. Thanks. All right. So let's recap. We got number one, feminist exclamation point question mark. <laughs> <laughs> number two, voice lessons as facilitated by Laurence Olivier. Correct. Number three, can uh, hold it. Um, <laughs> number yes. four, the name Thatcherism, Thatcherite. Yep. And number five, fan of the St. Francis Prayer. Category three? Yes. Category three. Malkovich, Malkovich. This category is named after the movie Being John Malkovich, in which people take a little uh, water slide. I've come to think of it as a water slide. Into John Malkovich's mind, where they have a front row seat to uh, one of his experiences. What do you have? What's your Malkovich? Mind? I think of what I'm going to go with is what I'm calling milk gate. So England had a program that free pints of milk are provided for children up through a certain age. It subsequently got reduced. But when she went in, this is the early 70s, I believe she was the equivalent of the Secretary of Education. And as a conservative politician, her job and duty essentially is to cut government spending. And so one of the first substantial acts she made was to end the free milk program for kids. The group she took it away from was age 7 to 11. And she said basically, like, we'll still provide for the younger ones so that others can buy their own milk. By the time you're 7, you're cut off. Yes. So what I want to see behind the eyes is, what the fuck were you thinking, Maggie? <laughs> Like, how are you going to get any support from any sides of the political aisle? How is any press going to like you? We understand your mission, but of all the things, you are never going to win literally taking milk away from children. So I guess <laughs> I want to really, be— It's cliche in its cruelty. It's like, you know, a few degrees away from taking candy from a baby, taking milk from a <laughs> seven-year-old. Exactly. You know? I mean, I see her as unafraid of a fight, to say the least. Do you think this is picking a fight? This is— Picking the dumbest fight you can possibly pick. Yes. Yeah. Well, but I mean, you know, a few years later, she becomes prime minister. I mean, I think it won admiration within her party for being, you know, steadfast. But if anybody was on the fence about her, 
I think it slid it back. Okay. But yeah, and it earned her the nickname at the time, Thatcher Milk Snatcher. Yes, I saw that. I think that one actually never totally went away. As a nickname, I feel like oh, that they were still like again. chanting that into the nineties. I think that's right. I mean, that's one of the problems with a figure like this. There is almost too much information and scrutiny of her. Like you could spend a lifetime combing through the archives of Margaret Thatcher. Yes, as opposed to say Curly Neal, who we're not exactly sure if he was ever married. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and correct. I wonder if Curly performed. He had to have. Yeah. He had to have played a game in front of her. Oh, that's a great question. Do you think she would enjoy the? I don't know. She's not much of a sports. She fan. might have popped in for and the Harlem believe Blackers. like I hear the black team from America is in town that does tricks. I should make an appearance. Yes, uh, and then get back to fighting the coal miners. Yes, exactly. <laughs> my Malkovich. Yes, my Malkovich moment. This is more of a curiosity one for me. I want to know what's going on in her mind. Okay, so October twelfth, nineteen eighty four. There's an attack. It's an assassination attempt on Margaret Thatcher. The IRA blows up, you know, has a bomb in, in Downing Street. And, IRA, for uh, clarification's sake. Is the Irish Republican Army? Is that what it yes. is? Yes. Yeah, and it was a considered by the UK to be a terrorist group for a number of years. They were fighting for Irish independence. It was a major sort of uh, violent entity that was trying to inflict harm on all kinds of people in power in the UK and Correct. try to kill Margaret Thatcher. So a bomb goes off. She... Escapes without injury, but, I mean, covered in ash. And, you know, this happens in the middle of the night in her nightgown. Let me just read you this from the biography I read. The bomb went off at 2.54 a.m. The prime minister was, as usual, awake and working on her speech for the next day. The air was full of thick cement dust, she recalls in her memoirs. It was in my mouth and covered my clothes as I clambered over and discarded belongings and broken furniture towards the back entrance of the hotel. She was taken to the police station where she changed from her night clothes to a Navy suit. Her friends and colleagues arrived, suggesting she return to number 10 Downing Street. No, she said, I am staying. Then, and this is what the author says, then, and this is the detail that makes you realize this woman is not like you and not like me. She laid down and took a short nap so she could be and fresh for the long day ahead of her. But a power nap, like, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to take a power nap. That is incredible. That's incredible. Right? I love napping, Amit. When I do nap, I mean, I need a quiet room and I need to, like, allow sleep to descend on me. That she could nap after an assassination <laughs> attempt? Like, holy shit. Uh, I want to know. Because I do think you have to have a certain kind of state of mind to allow, you know, the, the, the active part of your cognition to kind of relax and say, I'm going to let this go and I'm going to let allow sleep to come to me. Like, this is the trick of going to sleep, right? Yes, that she was able to do that after an assassination attempt is astonishing to me. That is astonishing. And I want to, I kind of want to know what are the thoughts in her mind as she's drifting off to sleep. I, I think she had a power of, of completely discarding thoughts. She must have. But this is why it's a Malkovich moment to me. That's a fantastic one. I love that one. So that's my Malkovich. Shall we go on? Yes. Category four, love and marriage. How many marriages? Also, how many kids? And is there anything public about these relationships? Okay. One marriage to Dennis in 1951. Dennis died in 2003, so they were married uh, for about 52 years. Margaret Thatcher was 26 when they got married. She, she was, was Margaret Roberts. She was Margaret Roberts at the time. About 77 or 78 when he died. By all accounts described as loving and supporting, that this was actually looked like a Pretty healthy marriage. And even though he is very much a conservative figure, he was supportive of his wife's career and even to some extent sacrificial, which I think that's sort of interesting. There are two children, twins, a boy and a girl, Mark and Carol. And did you watch The Crown season four? I've never seen any Crown. Okay. I only watched season four to get up to speed on Margaret Thatcher, as played by Gillian Anderson. There is an episode which begins with the Queen talking uh, to Margaret Thatcher, and she uses the phrase, my favorite child, my son Mark, and the Queen's like, uh, uh, did you say favorite child? <laughs> and I was like, oh, what dramatization by the writers of The Crown. But then I looked into it. She was very public about this. She had, was very clear, I had a favorite child. How terrible. Yeah. It's super fucked up. And the kids to this day have a contentious relationship with each other. 
sounds like. A lot of what we know about Margaret Thatcher's later years come from her daughter, Carol, who has a sort of interesting career her, as a journalist. Her second favorite child. Her second favorite child, the okay. other twin. The dramatizations I saw in both The Iron Lady and in The Crown had her spoiling her son, Mark. And I think it gets to this point that, you know, a lot of her critics lobby at her that she is a kind of man worshiper in a way. Mark yes. Thatcher. Apparently in later years, there is some reporting that she tried to have a different relationship, a better relationship with her daughter. And her Carol said, you know, that ship has sailed. Like, that's not going to happen. But yeah, super fucked up. Do you see anything in that with this this feminist question mark that we talk about her preferring the son yeah. over the daughter? Yeah, absolutely. The cynical interpretation is not hard to make, that she worships power and she's in a society where men have power. And so she downplays or dismisses any kind of like women first or woman first orientation or thinking in her politics or in her personal life. I mean, and this goes back to her childhood too. She is said to have absolutely worshiped her father who was a grocer. And my father never wasted a moment. He and my mother ran the shop and then he also was on our local council. He was chairman of our local finance committee. He was a doer, he was a giver. And having that background means that you absorb it right into your bloodstream, right from childhood. There's almost nothing on record about how she felt about her mother. This thread of just shining light on men is apparent throughout her entire life. I don't know what to make of that. I mean, I, mean, I guess that's how you get in good graces with a conservative party in the 70s. Yeah, I think that's true. So, yeah, I mean, it looks like a kind of power-hungry play in a way. I guess. I don't know. What do you see? So we know one marriage longstanding. What do you see behind the love curtain in that? Did you get anything from the biographies? I looked at tape and I don't see like... Affection? Yes. But they're British. I don't know. This and they're is... British of a certain generation. I'm just not sure how public they are about affection. I think that there was actual real love. It does sound like, I and mean, we'll get to this later... In her later years, she really suffered from advanced dementia. And it, apparently that starts around the year 2000, roughly. There is a, a story that Carol relays about having to break the news to her mother over and over that her husband has died. So she experienced that grief over and over again. And it sounds like real grief. I mean, I think she loved the man. I think he supported her career. You know, the marriage predates her entry into politics. So I don't know what to make of the marriage category here, other than the relationship with the children is super duper weird to me. Any parent who ever <laughs> says they have a favorite, I think you can struggle more with a child. But to say you favor one, like you like one more, boy, that misses the point of parenting for me. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not just very weird. It's grossly unhealthy and... But it, it's also so unnatural to me. I don't even rank my friends anymore. I think I did in grade school say this is my first best friend and my second best friend. But now, you know, I love different people for different reasons and like different people for different reasons. And this isn't something that needs, you know, an ordinal organization. <laughs> you know what I mean? Correct. I don't know. On one hand, I applaud Margaret Thatcher for a long, loving relationship with a life partner who supported her. That looks good. But the relationship with the kids is fucked up. All right. Shall we move on? I think so. Category five, net worth. What did you find? Ten mil. That's what I saw. Yeah, that seems like about right for that age of politician. That seemed low to me. She's so lionized. I mean, she is like, there are people who hate her, but there are people who love her. This biography I read, it starts off in roughly 2008 uh, presidential cycle, and all of these American presidential candidates are flying over to the UK for a photo op with Margaret Thatcher. At this point, her dementia is very advanced. She has no idea who these people are, but she is that important to conservative politics in America and really around the world. Holy cow. It, 10 million is very small then. It is. For that stature. Yes. So maybe there's another 10, 20, 30 just stuffed in mattresses in the Cotswolds. I do feel like there's one more point to be made here. I mean, I think that your take on her, especially if you're a British citizen, is going to really depend on how well or poorly you did under her leadership. And there's no question that this is the beginning of a growing inequality gap in the UK. 
So I don't know, something about 10 million sort of like downplays any sort of, I don't know, uh, assertions of cronyism. I think there's poor record keeping. I think there's money elsewhere, possibly in the favorite son. Yeah. Um, and she married, low. Dennis is wealthy. Like when she married him, it, it was a clear step up in her, you know, standard of living. Okay. All right. Shall we move on? Yes. All right. Category six, Simpsons, Saturday Night Live, or Halls of Fame. This category is a measure of how famous a person is. We include both guest appearances on SNL or The Simpsons, as well as impersonations. These are going to be fun. So I saw four impersonations on SNL, my favorite of which was John Lithgow. You are some tall drink of water. (laughs) Now, Princess Margaret... This is the first time I've had royalty on my show. So tell me, is it true that Charles and Di are leading separate lives? It's such a shame. Uh, I am the Prime Minister of Great Britain. (laughs) And I did not come here to engage in gossip about the royal family. (laughs) The purpose for my visit here in the United States was to bid farewell to a close friend and ally, Ronald Reagan. Oh, so you've been to the White House. Quite a place, isn't it? Of course, what am I telling you for? You live in a castle. Also, uh, in the late 70s, uh, right after she takes power, Michael Palin of Monty Python fame. So two different men impersonating the first prime minister of the UK is not coincidental. But then there were two others I saw, Mary Gross and Vanessa Bayer. Uh, I wasn't able to dig up those skits, but there you have it. She was impersonated at least four times. Okay. Can I bring into the SNL? Please. Are you familiar with Ian Rubbish? I am now because you told me about him, but I think you should explain it. <laughs> it was a it was a sketch when Fred Armisen was on Saturday Night Live, and it was a faux documentary, like in a This Is Spinal Tap sort of way, and it chronicled this band, Ian Rubbish and the Bizarros, and they were an '80s punk band. Ian Rubbish being the lead singer, but he was an ardent supporter of Margaret Thatcher, and he has songs out there that are like Maggie Thatcher, Maggie Thatcher, Maggie like Thatcher. political rallies for Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> That's a good one. But I never saw her make a guest appearance on Saturday Night Live, nor would she. One other note, and this is not exactly SNL, but I feel like I got to get it in there. There is a speech where she actually makes reference to the Monty Python dead parrot sketch. I gather that during the last few days... There have been some ill-natured jokes about their new symbol, a bird of some kind. So I will say only this of the Liberal Democrat symbol and of the party it symbolizes. This is an (laughs) ex-parrot. Simpsons, I only saw her mentioned in one 2004 episode called Codependence Day, Apparently, Otto, the bus driver, watches a documentary about the coal worker strikes and says, Mrs. Thatcher has blood on her hands. That's the only reference I found in The Simpsons. That's odd. Yeah. I would think, like, Mr. Burns would have referenced her. I I mean, who knows? I think it it would have been offhanded, but she never did her own voice, and she, I don't think, was ever uh, parodied. Okay. And then Halls of Fame. I didn't, she was never on Arsenio Hall, but uh, there is a whole Wikipedia page dedicated to her awards and honors. I mean, you could go on ad nauseum about how she's been lionized. I think overall, she's very famous. Unquestionably. Yeah. Category seven? Mm -hmm. Category seven, over under. In this category, we look at the generalized life expectancy for the year they were born to see if they beat the house odds and as a measure of grace. So life expectancy for women in the UK born in 1925 was 58.31. She died age 87. So she beat it by almost 30 years. As I mentioned earlier, dementia sets in around 2000, according to her daughter. Sounds like a pretty rough last 10 plus years. I think that's right. I think Dennis dies and I think that she loses her, you know, she would start sentences and not know how to finish. She wouldn't exactly know where she was going. Would you want to stay alive for that? Like, no, I understand the the problem of the siblings and the children of saying, like, you know, it's still our mother and she's living. Like, we can still see her inside of there. I don't know. Who knows what's going on inside? This is one of those really confusing, hard to know things. Correct. I, it, it, it's described as being very scary. And it looks scary. How can it be described? It's like, who knows? 
I mean, my understanding of things, and it's very imperfect, you can have some awareness that your mind is slipping or whatever you want to call it, that you're experiencing dementia, but that it can wax and wane. I mean, you hear people say he has good days and bad days, meaning recall is better or worse. And I don't know if when recall is better, you are like reminded, I used to be sharper. Would I want to experience it? I don't know, Amit. There's a part of me that wants to say, if you are at peace with yourself and you have cultivated an attitude of surrender and acceptance in your life, which I think is like a really important spiritual principle, then maybe it's not so bad. But maybe that's just a a really nice way of thinking about it, and that has no relationship to what it's actually like to be there. I mean, age scares me overall. I'm certainly scared about losing physical capabilities, you know, falling down more, more injuries, more pain. I feel like I could get to a place where it's like, well, maybe my body can't do what it used to do, but I, I, I'm i still happy to have, you know, most of my cognitive powers. To lose that, no, that looks really scary to me. Yeah, that would be scary. I think you brought up peace. I think that's a factor for me. Do you feel peace inside? Are you capable of feeling any joy? Yeah. Like when that when you eat that piece of toast, whether it's put in your mouth or not, does anything fire? And I think that's important. It's so hard to know what's going on inside, no matter what. You know? Yeah, but as with the limited information I have right now, I don't think so. It's a hard category for us on Famous and Gravy, right? Because we often are looking at people at the peak of their powers and what they accomplished when they, they were at their most vital and capable and when all the talents conspired to lead them to the rocket ship of fame and power and glory and fortune. And what was that like? Aging overall looks hard. This came up when we talked about Casey Kasem and having a degenerative disease that lasted several years. I don't want any of that, but, you know, I, 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 there's no way around it. There's a part of me that feels like I am crossing my fingers, you know, and hoping for as smooth a glide as I can possibly get on the descent towards, you know, old age and death. Right? This is a scary thing about life, man. Yeah. Well, you said that about, I think that was the last episode about your father-in-law. Like, he died died well. Yeah. Selfishly, I want to be there as much as possible. And if it's just my vessel and not my full humanity, I want to be able to go into the afterlife. Yeah. Gracefully, you know? I guess I'm sort of making the case for some version of assisted suicide or euthanasia, you know? Yeah, or just like a weekend at Bernie's type of thing. Like, they can that's keep your body the, that's alive. That's the ideal. The weekend at Bernie's <laughs> ideal. Just, no, that They actually, keep dressing the life. Or the, the Arrested Development surrogate for your, uh, for your demented vessel. Yeah. Well, that got heavy, but I guess we had to talk about it. Yeah, that was important, I think. Well, let's take a break. Michael, I want to talk to you about a void in my life. Uh, This is very famous in gravy. What's missing? It's in my liquor cabinet, Michael. I have lots of great whiskeys, things that I stand behind, very flavorful ones. Yeah. I don't have that in gin. Um, I have good gins. I have nice labels, but they all sort of taste the same. There's not the oh my God gin. I have great news for you. You have great news for me. I have great news for you. Have you heard about Linden Leaf, Jen? Linden Leaf products? I have not, but I think I know how to spell it. I'm pretty certain it's L-I-N-D-E-N. Correct. Linden Leaf is the first spirits company to handcraft their ultra premium products at the molecular level. Let me say that again. At the molecular level. Fine tuning flavors to create perfectly harmonious and exceptionally balanced spirits. So perhaps if I put this product in my liquor cabinet, I would have a flavorful aromatic gin that I can stand behind, earn credibility with all the guests and dignitaries that come to my apartment as I offer them a cocktail. You know who else you can serve? Famous and gravy listeners. You want to tell them about this? Everyone can find Linden Leaf products at shoplindenleaf.com, but only Famous and Gravy listeners can receive 20% off their first order using promo code FAMOUS20. That's FAMOUS20. Wow. Yeah, that is a hell of a deal for an ultra-premium 
product. That's incredible. Famous and Gravy listeners, you've got to try this. Linden Leaf 88 Gin, a perfectly balanced flavor experience crafted and tuned at the molecular level. At this point in the show, we get a little bit more speculative and really try and imagine what would it have been like to have been this person. The first of the inner life categories is man in the mirror. How did this person feel about their reflection? Ahmet, how did Margaret Thatcher feel about her reflection? I don't have a great deal of confidence in my answer. I think she liked it. I think she looked in the mirror and she saw power. She saw resolve. She saw determination. She basically looked the same every day. Yeah. Right? Uh, we the talk, hairstyle we doesn't about the hairstyle. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. There was just such lack of visibility of cracks, which leads me to believe the exact opposite. You know, that there is the inner child inside. There is something scared inside. And all she sees outside in her own body is this large defense of a vessel. So I'm going to go with yes. She liked it. She liked it, but also with the caveat of, I don't know how deep her self-awareness was, that she was willing to travel that path. I think she liked it. I think, you know, if you watch um, the Meryl Streep movie, there is a point in her political career where they're like, you've got to lose the hats. We've got to work on your voice. You know, apparently they called Laurence Olivier. I didn't know that part of it. But where there's a, a real deliberate attention to her, how she presents and how she speaks and how she looks. I do see her in interviews with a smile on her face in a way that does look pretty natural and confident. You know, I think you can grow to really like how you are coming across and lean into how you are persuasive and a very self-assured speaker. I'm with you. There's some question in my mind about, you know, in the middle of night at 4 a.m., if she comes across the mirror, what does she really see? But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lean yes to. Okay. Next category, outgoing message, like man in the mirror. How do they feel about the sound of their own voice when they heard it on an answering machine? Would they have left their own voice on an outgoing voicemail? I'm going with a stronger yes. She was a great speech giver. She was very quick. And I think her voice was her strength. Yeah. Would she actually do it from a self-importance point of view? Yeah, I think so. I think she'd still do it. You think so? You yes. heard the voicemail of Margaret Thatcher. I suppose there's some truth to that in that she's wanting to relate on a common level somehow and everybody else does not She's not going to have, you know, some deputy or some secretary create the voicemail for her. Yeah, it's sort of like I'm not going to waste government money <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. on this. It's a political question. I agree with all of that. I, I think she liked it. I also admire somebody who decides to work on their voice and to, like, this is how I sound in public speaking. I'm going to work on that. I think that there's also a class element there, though, too. I think that as she's trying to, you know, gain steam in the conservative party, that her working class background, like, was betrayed by her voice and that she worked to get rid of the accent. Yes. All right. Next category, regrets, public or private. We've covered a handful of these, but it is said that after she was ousted as prime minister, which that has its own saga, right? She, The biography I read certainly made a case that the things that led her to take power in the first place were also the same qualities that caused her demise, basically called her arrogant. She kind of dropped the ball in 1991 and got ousted from power. And it is said that she never again had a happy day in her life. Wow. Yeah. I mean, such a tale of the 80s and 90s yeah, of the distinction. So. It's remarkable. And I did see also, I mean, she was rarely spotted emoting, and they did catch her with tears in her eyes on that last day that she left down. Again. Yeah. And she got, I actually saw an interview with her where she teared up uh, when remembering it and in front, like on camera. We notice now that it's affecting you now, and it must have been yes, the most Yes, it's not affecting difficult. my voice. You're thinking back to traumatic things. But I managed to get through them. I thought about that. I even considered it as a Malkovich moment, because, like, what is the emotion there? Is it betrayal, I guess? I mean, she obviously loved being prime minister, and I think was never able to fill the void that that power gave her. I mean, I don't know. Is it unfair to look at her as, or any politician, as just being power-obsessed? I mean, I think she actually had conviction and cared about things, but that she only gets validation in life from having achieved power and then executing it? I don't think that's an oversimplification. I think is whether we should judge that or not. 
is a more difficult question. Well, maybe we'll save that because I do think that's an interesting question. And that, that feels Vanderbeeky. Yes. So other regrets, milk snatching we talked about. Falklands, right, largely derided as an unnecessary war with a lot of lives lost. Yeah. Did she ever express regret about it? No, I think quite the opposite. The commander of the operation has sent the following message. Be pleased to inform Her Majesty that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next, what, Mr. Knott? Thank you very much. What's your reaction, Just rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to night, declare gentlemen. war on Argentina, Thank you Mr. Very Thatcher? Much. Rejoice. This biography that I keep referencing, the woman who wrote it is an admirer of Margaret Thatcher because more than anything else, this author is anti-socialist. The way she tells the story is that, you know, Great Britain had been on the decline since World War II, economically and sociopolitically. After Margaret Thatcher's reign, I mean, London is reestablished as a financial center of the world. And the economy, by major metrics, is doing really well and, you know, has been performing better ever since. All of that political success, her ability to fight the coal miners and the unions and to, you know, have major, major tax cuts came because of the political capital she gained during the Falklands. That's my reading of history, and I think that's a pretty common reading of history. Whether it was political opportunism or I think it was, as understood by her, an attack on sovereignty. Yeah. And we should say, I mean, um, Diego Maradona, when we talked about him, episode 15, a large point in his life was the hand of God in the 1986 World Cup of Argentina versus England. That's right. A lot of the justification of fan support for that was, well, it's Argentina's turn to seek vengeance for the Falklands War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But no, I don't think she ever regretted it. Interesting. I think that's more or less it for regrets. We did mention earlier the trying to reform the relationship with her daughter. That's about it. Okay. All right. Next category, good dreams, bad dreams. So it's not about personal perception, but rather does this person look haunted? Do they have something in the eye that suggests inner turmoil, inner demons, unresolved trauma? I wanted to see it in the eye, but I didn't. And I'm just going to go to your nap story. I think she, I think she wiped it all away each night. I think so, too. But she's a mystery to me, and if it's there, it's not in the eye. Yeah, she is a mystery. So are you going good dreams also? I'm going good dreams also. Okay. Yeah. Uh, second to last category, cocktail coffee cannabis. This is where we ask, which one would we most want to do with our dead guest? This may be a question of what drug sounds like the most fun to partake with this person, or another philosophy is that a particular kind of drug might allow access to a part of them that we are most curious about. What do you have? Cannabis. Let's roll a joint, Maggie. And I'll tell you the reason. We know there's armor. We know there's great, great defenses out there. So you have to break through it. This is very much an access thing for me. Because I'm, I think I'm composed so differently, I want to know how you get to that stance of a little bit of every man for himself. Like, we don't need to be helping others. We just need to be giving people the tools for self-ownership and capitalism, and that solves everything. Yeah. I just want to know what that perspective is. Oh, it's interesting. I actually had all but the exact same thing. You know, pass that joint over here. It's my, my turn. And then back to Maggie. I also chose cannabis. I'm looking for where she understands fallibility. You know, I mean, that- Ooh, that, that's a good, yeah. I want to know how, where she understands- you know, imperfection and how she understands imperfection in other people. Because I'd, that's not self-evident to me based on, uh, you know, her very, very strongly held political views. Do you admire, uh, let's leave aside the actual, what her actual political agenda is. Do you admire somebody who has that kind of committed political agenda? Or is the whole thing too sort of, is the realm of politics too frustrating for you? I think both. The realm of politics is too frustrating, but yes, I do. I do admire it. Is it desirable? Not for me. It's a necessary thing. We need those people to let the world spin around. Yeah. I do believe in that. So I think this is rare that we actually both pick the same substance for the same reason. Yeah. So maybe me, you, and Maggie, we do it together. That sounds nice. There is the problem that they're dead that we haven't <laughs> yeah. yet figured out. Well, we get to create this scene and, you know, the theoretical afterlife. This is correct. Okay. Are we there? 
What are there? The Vanderbeek, named after James Vanderbeek, who famously said in Varsity Blues, I don't want your life. Do you want me to go first? Yes, you rarely offer, so I feel like you have something good to say. I feel like I'm having to wade through a lot to give this a very fair Vanderbeek because I don't really want to hang out with her. I don't find her particularly likable. I'm starting to wonder if the desire to be liked is a really dangerous, if not natural, character trait. It's one I wish I could downgrade in my life. I'd like to be okay with not being liked and holding conviction. There's a mythologizing of Margaret Thatcher that transcends her actual experience as a person on planet Earth. I think that she is understood where people say, what an incredible transcendent figure. That on its face is not appealing to me. Like, I don't want to a statue of me. But there's definitely a part of me that admires not just an idealist, but an idealist who sets a goal and then executes on it. You know, there is a lot of claim that she deserves significant credit for ending the Cold War, in part because she establishes a relationship with Gorbachev and then sort of signals to Ronald Reagan, this is a man you can work with. I mean, she she does some matchmaking there. Yes. And that's an incredible accomplishment. And it's one that should be, for whatever other shortcomings she has, I think it's there's a reason that's in the first line of her obituary. So to have a belief about how the world should be organized and then to deliver on it, I admire that. The long marriage is incredible. I don't know, man. Maybe the the favorite kid thing really <laughs> sticks in my craw. Yeah. It's a little hard to get past that. I think I gotta go now. I mean, I'm kind of trying to talk myself into it. And as I studied her more and got my, you know, got closer to it, I, I was looking for things. There's lots to admire, and I'm I'm glad I've done a deep dive on Margaret Thatcher. But where's the joy? And if the joy is in power. God, that has a limit, you know? And you feel that as you lose your cognitive abilities as a human. That that seems more tragic to me than something to be celebrated, even if you were incredibly transcendent at the peak of your powers. Yeah. I mean, maybe the dementia is not so coincidental. I, I don't know. I don't want to necessarily say cosmic justice, <laughs> but I do think that there's a relationship between how tragic that looks and what she was all about, you know, in the years preceding it. Yeah. Okay. So you're a no. So I, I really like what you said about having ideals and executing on them. I mean, that is goal setting, yeah. right? Like if you go through any type of self-help and even lots of religion and, and all forms of schooling, it's set a goal and work towards it. And that's what she did. That is a formula for fulfillment as best we know it. And that's something to be wanted, right? If I'm to separate myself from the belief in the politics, that is something to be wanted. You know, when I was in grad school, I remember there was a course on level five leadership, which is basically the most effective leaders across the world in, in anything, not just business and, and government, but even uh, sports households and whatever. And it's the two factors were humility and fierce resolve. Yeah. Uh, no doubt Margaret Thatcher had fierce resolve. I saw almost zero signs of humility. The opposite. Yeah. She may have been effective in getting it done. Was she fulfilled enough in her likability? No way to be that divisive. I don't think that's the reason that I would say no, and I am going to say no. I am going to say no to the Vanderbeek, and I think it's the profession. It's the whole life by God, you had such a huge impact on the world. You will not be forgotten for a long time. You changed a country. But the absence of joy, the absence of humility, and the, in my perspective, the absence of self-awareness and self-knowledge, I'm going to go and no. This is fucking driving me crazy, this knocking. Yes. 
Is, is, it, is it knocking on heaven's door? Is this perhaps yeah, how we might introduce? Be. This, is, this is how we're going to end. If the, this if this makes the tape, listeners, the city of Austin is doing pro, work yeah, programming <laughs> mode outside of the studio right now, where there appears to be just hammering against metal sheets for no other for, reason. Yeah, than for it's, like it may the, be Morse code for the xylophonic response. Yeah, they're installing a new gas line right below our studio. All right, so we're here. We're here. We're at the part of the gates. I can take this. St. Peter. Yes, Margaret. <laughs> Maggie here. <laughs> I think I was an unlikely figure to have achieved the power I did, but I do feel like I was driven to a higher calling and supported by a higher power on my way to the prime ministership. This is why I said the St. Francis prayer on my way in the door is that I tried to, as best I could, have a clear vision for what I wanted to do. And world events conspired so that I was given a tremendous amount of political capital to execute my agenda. And while I did it with some level of controversy and not everybody liked it, I felt it was necessary and I stand by everything I did. I think I left the world and my country a better place. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I followed my heart. Please, let me in. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Famous and Gravy. If you're enjoying our show, please tell your friends about us. Help spread the word. Also, if you're interested in participating in the opening segment where we quiz people about who today's dead celebrity is, feel free to submit your name. You can reach us at hello at famousandgravy.com. That's hello at famousandgravy.com. Find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at famousandgravy. And we also have a newsletter, which you can sign up for on our website, famousandgravy.com. Famous and Gravy was created by Amit Kapoor and me, Michael Osborne. This episode was produced by Jacob Weiss. Original theme music by Kevin Strang. And thanks so much to this week's sponsor, Linden Leaf Organic Molecular Spirits. Again, you can get a 20% discount on our website if you use our promo code FAMOUS20. That's two zero. Thanks for listening. See you next time.